gentlemen, let's call to order the Merrimack Planning Board meeting for July for July 20th, 2021. Let's do that again. Good evening. Let's call to order the Merrimack Planning Board meeting for July 20th, 2021. Uh, let's begin. Let's see. We don't have any alternates to appoint into a voting position. We do have one member participating by phone. Jamie, can you hear me? I can. Oh, excellent. And we can hear you. Okay. Let's see. Our normal housekeeping items are... Uh, next meeting after tonight is August 3rd, 2021 at 7 p.m. in this room, the Matthew Thornton Room. Um, everyone that will address the board, please make sure your microphones are turned on and to speak clearly into them um, so that the folks at home can hear you. Also, please ensure that applicants and any speaking members of the public clearly identify yourself for the record. We are preparing the minutes from the record and the, so the recording matters this time. That completes the usual call to order items. Tim, do you have a Planning and Zoning Administrator's Report for us today? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. In your packet, you'll find a memo dated July 8th from myself for the regional impact determination on the John J. Flatley Company's project to construct an internal access road out at the properties associated with the mixed use conditional use permit project. Uh, the staff uh, recommends that the board determine this is not of regional impact as it does not meet the criteria for the regional impact determination. What's the will of the board? I'll make so move. Is there a second? Second. Motion in the second. Motion by Lynn, uh, second by Neil. All in favor say aye. <coughs> aye. Aye. Any opposed? Mr. In Chairman, because we have a person participating by phone, you have to do roll call votes. All right, let's do a roll call vote. Jamie, you get to vote first. Jamie? Hello, Jamie. Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was just meeting. Um, yes. Vote yes. Barbara? Yes. Neil? Yes. Paul? Aye. Lynn? Yes. I vote yes as well. So that is uh, six of us, six zero zero, uh, to uphold the regional impact recommendation. Tim, do you have any other items? Uh, nothing else at this point uh, other than to just state that uh, for those that don't know yet, uh, Sharon Haynes from my office is actually transferred up to the general government town manager's office oh. a few weeks ago. Uh, so I am in the process of trying to fill her position. Uh, I do have a couple of candidates that had applied for the position that Sharon eventually ended up in, and uh, we're hopefully getting down to the final details to get somebody in the position shortly. Sounds good. Is it a full-time or part-time position? It's part-time position. Okay. Um, any questions by members of the board for the staff? Seeing none, then let's move on to item three on our agenda, which is Thomas Moore College as the applicant and Thomas Moore Foundation as the owner. Continued review for consideration of a site plan amendment to improve parking and pedestrian walkways within the campus grounds. The parcel is located at 6 Manchester Street in the I-1 Industrial and the Aquifer Conservation District Tax Map 2D, Lot 41-4. It's case, planning board num case number Planning Board 2021-23, and it is continued from our June 15th planning board meeting. Tim, is there anything that we need to know before we hear from the applicant? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the board. Uh, this, again, was before the board back on June 15th. Uh, uh, Mr. Turner and his group gave a very nice overview presentation of the project and what the college is hoping to accomplish. Uh, we did receive the peer review comments on June 24th, and the applicant submitted revised plans on July 8th. Uh, with this latest submittal, uh, we can report that they've addressed the vast majority of uh, the review comments that we had from the original review. Uh, and a new waiver is being requested regarding uh, parking uh, for an educational facility. They're providing 54 spaces where 82 are required. Uh, however, I believe that the applicant does have uh, reasonable justification for the board to consider for that waiver uh, based on the, uh, the specific circumstances of the Thomas More College and how they operate. Uh, outside of that, uh, we recommend uh, the board move forward with the vote on the waivers and then ultimately on a final vote to uh, our recommendation would be conditional approval per the uh, recommendations in uh, Casey's memo. Thank you, Tim. I see a number of waivers in my notes. Are those yet to be dealt with or did we address those last time? None of the waivers have been dealt with at this point. The parking is new. The others were carried over from the last meeting. All right. Thank you for that. Okay. Who's here for the applicant? Good evening. For the record, Austin Turner with Bowler. Um, as was mentioned in the opening, you know, we were here uh, last month. We went through um, the application and have subsequently responded to the comments that were provided uh, by your staff and the independent peer review consultant, respectively. 
I feel like we're at a reasonable point, and as was noted in the um, staff memorandum, recommending a conditional approval. Uh, I've, I've reviewed those conditions and some of the items that were discussed in there. I feel comfortable that they could be uh, addressed uh, expeditiously and quickly. Nothing in there struck me as a problematic, more technical variety, perhaps some additional clarifying notes and, and things of that nature. I'd be happy to run through any of the items in that memo, or if you, if the board thought it appropriate to go through any of the waivers that were requested, I'd be happy to do that as well. Uh, board, what's your pleasure? Are you interested in hearing the discussion of the uh, peer review memo, um, or what you want to lead off to uh, talk about waivers? It's typically been our approach to focus on the waivers and leave it to our staff to look to focus on the technical peer review memo, but have at whatever you like. Which way do you want to go? Yeah, waivers. We can address the waivers. Lead us through the waivers, and uh, um, to the extent that they're somewhat related, perhaps we can deal with them all at once yeah. and certainly. kind of understand them all. So. Yep, certainly. So the, the, the first one, just going in order of how the, how the ordinance is structured, was with respect to driveways. It's item 3.08.C.2. The ordinance or the, the regular site plan requirements refer to that only one driveway per lot. As, as you may be aware, and just as a quick reminder, this property has had multiple driveways uh, historically, uh, some of which are being restructured or converted to an exit only driveway or reconfigured to um, dual access being exit and egress uh, based on some of our discussions with emergency response personnel. Um, respectfully, you know, the waiver is requested to, to maintain those multiple driveways and reconfigured obviously to accommodate the formalization of the parking. That was one of the first waivers. I can pause, or if you'd like me to go through them all, I'd happy to go through them all. Uh, you can continue. Okay. The first one certainly sounds like it's uh, better safe than sorry, because I'm not sure the waiver was necessary in the first place, but let me have it if you already got it. But go ahead. Next. Yeah, next sure. One. Uh, second one was uh, what was just referenced was 3.11.E, minimum required parking. So what, what we're noting on here doesn't have the, the parking as the site plan requirements would would suggest for an educational facility. However, as we had discussed previously, this particular effort isn't necessarily intended to increase enrollment, change their operations, but more kind of improve it from the dirt parking lots. So this is more of a formalization of the parking that's existed historically. And, and operationally, the college feels very, very comfortable that this meets their needs. As we had talked about, not every single student is getting a parking pass, and nor do they occupy every single space with employees and staff for events or, or things of that nature. So they feel quite comfortable that this parking, as we're showing it, meets their operational expectations both currently and, and for what limited expansion or additional enrollment they may incur in the future. Uh, as such, we respect, respectfully requesting that waiver as well. How many spaces do you have and how many does the formula say you need? So, uh, 54 sure I... are proposed where 82 are required. Excellent. Are these shown on the plan somewhere? Yes, yes. sir. That's correct. They're shown on C, uh, plan sheet C301. Well, while you're looking at that, Mr. Chairman, just wanted to point out that the, the, required, the requested waiver from 308C2 isn't necessarily a waiver. The specific section allows the planning board and or public works to allow more than one driveway. So by approving this plan, you basically have granted that. So there is no actual waiver necessary for the multiple drivers. Excellent. I was uh, approaching it from the fact that it's already pre-existing yep. and would have been dealt with in the past. It's, but either way, that's fine. Okay, so um, 54 spaces where 80... 82, two, I believe. Yep. 82 would have been required. Okay. And it's, uh, it's the applicant's experience that that's sufficient number of spaces for them? Yes, sir. That's is correct. that a reduction as a result of this development that we're doing now, or is it about what you've already had there? It's it's about what we've already had there. It, in fact, it might be a slight increase. Um, it's, it was hard to tell, frankly, how many spaces were there because it was more where you could you park as opposed to where it was formally delineated. Okay. But um, that's right. It was all dirt space. It was all just dirt spaces. Yeah, the people parked where they could, <coughs> and we're formalizing it and feel comfortable. That's suitable okay. for operational needs. Any board members have questions about the parking waiver? Mm -mm. Okay. Barbara? Yeah. Um, when you appeared the last time and the folks from the college were with you, they had mentioned, you know, there's additional work going to be done with, you know, revamping the men's and women's dormitories mm -hmm. again and moving around some of the parking lots in various positions. And he did mention that their long-term goal is, in fact, to maybe increase enrollment not overwhelmingly, but judiciously. So I'm wondering, it's only 28 parking places. If the plan is in the future, when all the building is completed, to maybe have slightly increased your enrollment, is it 
should you be considering whether you just put in 28 more parking places or do you intend to come later back to the board to say yeah we need 28 parking places well I think it's a great question and I, th I think you know we've spent a lot of time with the college orchestrating this master plan and, and kind of this being called the enabling work really feel comfortable this would meet the expectations the increase in enrollment would be fairly nominal and and like I'd mentioned they don't the parking passes are fairly limited. They've been monitoring how many parking passes are requested over, over a number number of years that they've been operating and feel quite comfortable that, that this number of space exceeds the operational expectations now, but also in the future when, when they create some of the campus improvements. So, and if, if, if for some reason they felt like it wasn't, we're obviously, as, as the campus grows and evolves, we're going to be in, in front of you all as part of that you know amended site plan in the future. Um, if if we felt for some reason that that changed, we'd be talking to you about that, obviously. But don't don't foresee that being the case right now. Okay, because it would be cheaper to put the extra twenty eight in now while the construction is going on and all the crews are there versus bringing them in on a special trip. Certainly, you do the twenty eight parking places in the future. So uh, certainly, and I, again, we don't don't feel that's necessary right now, and kind of want to maintain that okay. part. Of it. We wouldn't build it um, overbuild, I guess. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I think also if you um, come with those other improvements to do some dormitory changes, that's obviously an additional layer of construction that might have different considerations with parking when that comes up, and we can all address those things when they come up. Sure, and I certainly appreciate the question because I can understand they plan for the future and try and do it now, we, and we feel like we are. We are. <laughs> I also um, sort of have come to favor less parking um, just to not have so much expanses of pavement and a little bit more green space and everybody think critically about you know how can they live with a little bit less parking more walkable more compact uh, more well-designed developments I think makes sense but that's two cents mine <laughs> mine too, mine too. Mm -hmm. Lynn's too. okay uh, what's your next waiver okay so next waiver was for 3.11 point K point one which is respect to curbing so the, the site plan requirements state that curbing shall be provided as needed to control traffic into direct stormwater. So what we're doing here to try and maintain that kind of rural internal part of the campus feel, there are a number of parking spaces in here, particularly along uh, like the hand things working tonight. The northern part of the, or the, I guess we'll call that the it's west, but plan up, and a number of the perimeter areas, we're not including parking. We're allowing the drainage to kind of take its natural course, get into some perimeter swales, vegetated swales, and meander as it normally would. So we're not including curbing that way to direct drainage because our drainage is really country-style stormwater where we don't have a closed drainage network. Where curbing helps direct runoff, we're collected at low spots. We're, we're kind of trying to keep maintain that natural field to the extent that we can, and, and as such, are requesting a waiver from the, the curbing around the perimeter parking areas. Makes sense. Any questions on that one, folks? Okay, what's next? Okay, next one was 3.11.L.C, which was internal uh, parking lot landscaping. And again, mo most of that, that requirement, and kind of paraphrasing, is with respect to providing appropriate street trees or screening around parking areas to try and buffer them from view. Many of these, or if not all of these parking areas, are kind of located internally to the campus and are screened from the road by existing immature vegetation. And as, as accordingly feel that we've met the spirit and intent of that just by default, really. And so we don't want to tear down trees to put up trees or have to clear areas to put up <coughs> new trees. So we feel like the, the parking lots and areas are, are screened appropriately by the existing vegetation by way of their location and just because we've kind of thought about it a little bit. As the author of that regulation, I would agree. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't disagree with you. Can you provide some specifics as to what would be required if you tried to comply with this regulation? So the the, or, the requirement specifically reads that we'd have um, one deciduous shade tree for every 15 parking spaces and set back at least five feet minimum from the face of the curb. So we have 54 spaces doing some quick math. There is also the 10% internal requirement if it's in the front of the primary structure, 8% of it's on the side, or 5% of it's in the rear, which really doesn't apply to a situation like this campus because it's all in around. Focus. Nope, it has a front yeah. side or back, um, and there's trees surrounding all of your parking lots already. Yeah, and, and we're working with the, the campus. Obviously, the college is going to incorporate landscaping internally once the, these improvements are constructed to provide some additional uh, beautification. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what's next? 
Okay, next one <coughs> was uh, 3.13 point E, which is parking lot lighting. So we're not proposing any new lighting. With, there, there might be some wayfinding lighting as we had discussed on the campus, perhaps on a cedar pole, and it's gonna look very um, kind of lantern style to blend in with the feel of the campus, but we're not proposing kind of that commercial lighting feel for the parking lot areas here. Okay. Questions about that for anyone? Are you confident there'll be sufficient light for people to feel safe as they move around the campus and um, come and go in the wintertime when it gets dark at noon? <laughs> or, or in July when it's raining for seven straight days? Yeah. Uh, yes, I do. And we're working with the architect and the, and, the, and the college to specifically and strategically locate that lighting around pathways, parking areas, major points of access or egress to make sure it's not overly illuminated but appropriately illuminated. But it's not going to be anything where you're going to see kind of this, this illumination or luminaire plan where you see you know, foot candles measured at every 10 feet or five feet. It's gonna be appropriately for intersections and things like that. Okay. Which, I don't, what's that? <laughs> which leads into? Which, which, which I'm, I'm skipping out of order, but 4.16, which is illumination plans, obviously they go hand in hand. We're requesting a waiver from the photometrics plan that would accompany the more formal lighting plan. Um, can you give me a quick rundown of who your abutting properties are and what they're what they've got going on in their parcels? Certainly. The aerial will probably be helpful, right? So you can see, so here this is the Y up on the hill. Okay. And then across the street, just kind of on an angle just off the image here, I think it's a, a partially uh, partially um, occupied like office building, partially vacated, I suspect based on the last fifteen months. Uh, and then really it's Daniel Upster Highway. Henry Clay Drive in Manchester Street, so that the nearest <laughs> use is really the Y in that partially occupied office building across the street. So the Y is way up the hill from you guys. So yeah. whatever lighting you do isn't going to bother anybody. I don't. I don't. I don't think so. Fair enough. Yeah. Okay. Really, the only other businesses along Henry Clay are the self storage facility and the uh, crematorium. Okay. Imagine the self storage has got more lights than you by far. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. What else do you want? The next two are related, so I'll lump them together. It's 3.14, which is traffic impact analysis, and ironically, 4.17, which is also traffic impact analysis. So it, we're requesting a waiver from that, re from those requirements on account of the fact that we're not really generating any additional traffic. Again, it's more of a formalization of the existing parking facilities. So parking facilities in their own right don't generate traffic, and as such, we're requesting the waiver from those requirements. Okay. Uh, does anyone have questions about the traffic analysis um, <coughs> let's see I'll turn it over to the board to determine whether uh, you want to address all of these waivers in a single motion or whether there's groups with the driveways and landscaping and then the traffics are separate or whatever you guys think we just got to tie it to one of the two statutory requirements I think we can do it all in one swell foop sounds like a motion there which I, which I, statutory I, criteria were you picking strict conformity would pose an unnecessary hardship to the Africans or would not be contrary to the spirit and intent of the regulations. Is there a second for second. Lynn's motion? Second by Councilor Healy. Um, further <coughs> discussion? If not, uh, let's see, we've got to do a roll call. Jamie, how do you vote? Yes. Barbara? Yes. Neil? And vote aye. Paul? No. Lynn? Yes. I vote yes. Uh, so that is 5-1-0 to grant the waivers. Um, with that in mind, um, Let's see, are there any abutters or interested citizens who wish to weigh in on the application? Seeing none, <coughs> uh, board members, I'll leave it open to you to have general dialogue with the applicant. Any questions about anything that they proposed? And if there's none, then it's appropriate for the board to consider what potential final action it might undertake. What's the will of the board? I'll make a motion <coughs> that we grant, based on the information available, uh, grant final conditional final approval on the application with the following precedent conditions based on the staff memo to be fulfilled within six months. Is there a second for Lynn's motion? Second. Second by Councillor Healy. Further discussion? Then let's do a roll call vote. Um, Jamie, how do you vote? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> Barbara? Yes. Neil? Vote aye. Paul? Vote aye. Lynn? Aye. I vote aye as well. Six zero zero to grant conditional final approval. <coughs> uh, thank you for the presentation. Thank you for the good work. Uh, I look forward to your future developments. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much, and we'll see you very soon. We have uh, some more 
on the horizon here. Yeah. More exciting stuff. More exciting stuff coming, yes. That's All good. right. The next item on our agenda is item number four. It's Garrett Verby as the applicant and 385 DW Highway LLC as the owner. Review for consideration of a waiver of full site plan review to permit a mixed use development consisting of a single family dwelling and a contractor storage yard. The parcel is located at 385 DW Highway in the C1 General Commercial Aquifer Conservation and Elderly Housing Overlay Districts. It's tax map 43, lot 90, case planning board 2021-10. Tim. Mr. Burby does not appear to be here tonight. Uh, so I would recommend that the board continue this application to August 3rd at 7 p.m. Okay. Um, um, so moved. So moved. Second. Is there a second? Motion and a second to continue to August 3rd when the applicant <coughs> can be here. <coughs> Discussion? I see none. Let's do a roll call vote. Jamie? Yes, I. Yep, I Barbara? Yes. Neil? I vote aye. Paul? I vote aye. Lynn? Aye. Bob votes aye as well. Um, so six zero zero for that. Nope. Don't know why he's not here. Especially since we were ready to grant an approval. So. Yeah. That's I, <laughs> I think he's got. I think he got in pretty good shape. Okay. Item five on our agenda is the John Flatley Company as the applicant and owner. It's continued review for acceptance and consideration of a site plan to construct a 120,000 square foot warehouse and distribution building per the requirements of the Flatley mixed use conditional use permit. The parcel is located at 707 Daniel Webster Highway in the I-1 Industrial District and Aquifer Conservation Area. Tax map 6E, lot 36, case planning board 2021-24. It's continued from our June 15th, 2021 planning board meeting. Um, as has been my practice, I will recuse myself from consideration of this item as well as item number six and turn it over to our more than capable vice chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, before we dive in, Timmer, is there anything we need to know about this project? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, this project didn't actually get a formal presentation or introduction at the last meeting. Uh, was condition it was continued both the acceptance and the hearing. Uh, at that time, the traffic impact analysis had not been submitted in time for staff review. Uh, that did take place prior to the last meeting, but again, staff didn't have an opportunity to review it. Uh, so we're back here tonight. Uh, this proposes a 100,000 square foot, uh, uh, excuse me, 120,000 square foot high bay uh, warehouse office distribution facility uh, located to the north of the St. Cobain uh, performance plastics uh, portion of that uh, section of DW Highway, and it is part of the flatly mixed use conditional use permit. Uh, this a similar plan for high bay warehousing has been proposed going back probably nine years or so ago uh, that was actually proposed to be behind St. Cobain at uh, a point, like I said, nine years ago got to the point of getting a conditional approval, never followed through on the conditions, that plan expired. Uh, they went through the conditional use permit process and now it's being uh, proposed in this new location. Uh, access to this would be off of the existing driveway for St. Cobain uh, to Daniel Webster Highway. Um, the information has been uh, submitted to and we have received back peer review comments from Fuss O'Neill. However, we do not have plans revised from the applicant to uh, address those issues. So my recommendation tonight would be that the board vote to find the application complete, uh, open the discussion with the applicant, get some feedback so they can uh, move forward with the appropriate plan revisions and uh, continue the application, uh, the hearing to August 17th um, at that point. Thank you, Tim. Sir, it's good to have you here. Introduce yourself, please, and uh, show us what we have. Uh, Nathan Chamberlain, professional engineer with Field Storm Rain Control. Uh, so, as Mr. Thompson stated, uh, we're here for the uh, high bay site. It's part of the flatly conditional use permit. Um, as they also stated, <clears throat> this same building and essential layout was previously approved down here on. 6E5-5, the applicants chose to move it up to this location instead so they can have a contiguous undeveloped property down here for master planning purposes and we'll be here next month to talk about that. Um, it has gone f for review 
by Fuss and O'Neill. A short traffic study, as required, was presented, was prepared, and uh, Fuss and O'Neill has reviewed that. A very minimal comments on that. As far as their the site review comments, uh, there's really nothing substantial in those comments, just a lot of cleanup type issues. So um, we could certainly work through those. Um, the parcel is approximately 13.6 acres. It's in the I-1 zone. Uh, it's set far back from the road. Part of that reason is because uh, the CUP has a little commercial pad up here. I think it's 20 or 80,000 square feet. So that's probably your mark for that, your mark for that area. Um, but this, this building uses up pretty much the rest of the entire parcel as well as some of 5-5. And you flip to the site plan itself. This really doesn't show a lot because we need to show the entire parcel plus there's a lot of notes that are required uh, per the town requirements so we're just showing the, the outline of the parcel and the building situated on it you get more detail when you go into the uh, site plan we are seeking a waiver for uh, trees over 15 inches and a lot of this parcel was clear cut back when this in 2012 when the high bay was originally down here so this tree line this is this lower area is pretty much all clear cut at that time it's scrub brush now i'm not sure what the condition of these woods are but essentially the location of the trees really doesn't benefit it's not like we're going to adjust the site to save a tree so we just just make it simple and ask for a waiver from that requirement and that requirement came in after the survey for this property was done uh, so we'd have to resurvey and go out there and locate any trees just to cut them down. So just a note for the board that waiver was granted in the uh, Flex Industrial site uh, located just to the south of this in the most recent. Correct. Uh, Over cool. here. Thank you, Tim. It was brought to our attention in the Fuss and O'Neill that there might be some uh, some light some light levels that don't quite meet their ordinance. So we. We need a waiver from that as well. This is a site-specific soil map. Again, basically a carryover from the uh, previous approval. We just extended the limits. So now we get into more of a site layout plan. It shows a little more detail of the layout. As you can see, this is the uh, St. Gobain Driveway, which is signalized at the intersection with Daniel Webster Highway. And this is the exact same location and uh, configuration as the previously approved driveway that went down to 5-5, or 3-5, I'm sorry. Um, so we think it's a pretty good layout. We have the parking up here adjacent to the, you know, the offices on these are typically located in the front, and then it's all warehouse in the back. Uh, so we've segregated the truck traffic. It goes around to the rear to the loading bays from the, you know, vehicle uh, worker slash uh, visitor traffic up front here. Provided good pedestrian circulation and access along the front of the building. I noticed the, we did submit an architectural plan and there's a little discrepancy between the doors on the architectural plan or what's shown here. This was taken verbatim from the previous approval, so we'll have to work out those we'll, with the applicant and see you know where these doors exactly have to be and we'll adjust the plan accordingly. Uh, I know staff had a comment about the proximity of this building with the setback line. I took a look at that before the meeting and it is right on the line, but we could make a slight adjustment there to give a little bit of a cushion. Um, again, plenty of plenty of loading space. There's a wetland back here. Basically, the highway discharges into a culvert and it kind of flows down to this wetland and then off the property. That wetland continues down to a culvert that goes underneath the uh, railroad tracks, which is our observation point for the drainage. And as can be seen here, we are crossing the corner of uh, 63-5, e flatly, as, as you know, owns this property as well. So we just ask for an access season here, and I think this is the area where the light trespass is going over the property line that we need a waiver for. Then we have this rather large uh, detention basin. <laughs> the reason it's so large is it's taking, well, for one thing, we can't do infiltration on this site per uh, DES, and you know these are ideal soils for infiltration, and unfortunately, we know can't take advantage of them. So this is basically the same type of design we did on the flex buildings, which a large basin with a small orifice for the, for the uh, uh, water quality storm. 
and then it outlets to a treatment swale down here close to the property line. But this, the reason it's so big is because it's taken, uh, just slip back here. It's taken flow from about the, this is the limit of the Wellhead Protection District, and about that area is being a future plan to go into that base, and that's why it's one reason it's so big. the grading plan. Oh, it's in color. <laughs> I put, printed out a color one for the uh, Conservation Commission meeting. So yeah, it's a, it's a big basin. Uh, the berm's probably eight feet high in the back and then a little bit higher in the front here where the driveway is. Um, and it outlets and it steps down here, the slope to this treatment swale, as I mentioned before, and out. And here's that culvert that goes under the highway. The whole area drains down to that culvert currently. Uh, so we've maintained the, the flows to that culvert and the flows to the river in the drainage calculations. It's a combination of open and closed drainage. So this front portion, the portion is open swales, and then the, the roadway is open swales as well to a cross culvert. And then the, there's a bunch of roof leaders that come off. It's a big building, so we got a bunch of roof leaders that come down and tie into this closed drainage system, and then this closed drainage along the loading dock and back that comes routed around to here. It's going to be a duplicate of this. As far as utilities, um, we're pulling the utilities off of Daniel Webster Highway. So this is the exact same water line that was proposed for the, the 2012 proposal back here. But in this case, we're keeping it in this future loop road. So the plan is to loop this road back around to uh, Daniel Webster Highway. Back to my overview again. So the plan is to bring it up in here. This is the old fish hatchery somewhere, I think it's just adjacent to the Fitch Hatchery, and then down and around the back of St. Gomain, right, and tie in right to here. It's the next item on the agenda tonight. Right, so that's the loop road that we'd be coming in later. But yeah, the, so the utilities are coming down, and we'll, the water main would tie in back, back into the main that's in Daniel Webster Highway, so that, that would be a loop system. Uh, same with the electrical, and then the gas as well, we also loop back. The gas, we really don't get into detailed design that's done by the gas company. Uh, it's kind of a placeholder shown here, and then they'll, once they have the loads, they'll size it, and they'll actually do the construction too. So we don't spend a lot of time detailing and specifying that because they do their own construction uh, with their own specs. So um, I think that's it as far as utility. Yeah, so underground utilities. Uh, Power would drop to a rise of pole and then drop underground, and that would come down, feed the site, and then be continued on to the loop road. And uh, same with the water and the gas. Go. Oh, one thing I didn't mention is the uh, the sewer is actually shown on the grading plan. I apologize because it's. It was hard to get this on one sheet, so we some sheets show the front half, some show the back half. So I noticed Fuss and O'Neill had a comment about the sewer tie-in, which there's already a stub here. So he's saying it's going against the flow, but I don't think it really is. If it is, it's very minimal. It's, I mean, the, the stub is already here, so it's already been designed, basically, and we're just tying into an existing stub out of this manhole and bringing it up along with our, you know, our drainage outfall is going down, and alongside the sewer. And then we throw out a stub here for the future development here, and our connection is over here to this manhole. So that's feeding, the, that's the sewer layout. So here's the way we get into the lighting. Um, so I think we're good. So we got some point twos over in here along the Fussino Drive. Uh, Fussino, I'm, I'm sorry, the uh, that was my comment, not 
Oh, this in here? Yeah, so primarily we're talking about right in here. So we're lighting our access drive, we have some building lights, but we have this property line here, so we're over. We need a waiver for this, basically. The staff has no problem with the waiver, it just needs to be asked for. So that has not submitted form, been submitted formally. And then landscaping, uh, I think staff had some comments regarding some a couple of the species, but other than that, I think it meets all the requirements. Uh, there's a note we did get. You're dealing in this as a side parking lot. DW is considered the front for this. So. Okay, so we weren't sure on that. So to be safe, we said it's the front parking lot. So 10 percent, but we only need 8 percent interior. So I guess we can nick some of the interior and put, add some more parking. <laughs> no. We'll update the notes, leave it the same. Uh, but so it's really, it looks like it's quite a bit of landscaping for an industrial use. Uh, I think it'll look nice. I think that just about covers everything. As I, as I mentioned, the Fussin O'Neill comments, there's nothing real major there. Uh, everything is certainly easily addressed. There's nothing major regarding the drainage, <coughs> the building. Uh, so if you have any questions, I can feel happy to answer them. Thank you for that brief summary. Board members, before we get uh, into any questions, if you have any, we need to um, accept this application as complete. I'll if that to, is. I'll move to do. Motion made by Lynn. Do I have a second? A second. Second by Neil. I believe we have to do the roll call vote. Jamie? Jamie, are you there? Hi. Yep. How do you vote? Um, I'm actually going to abstain. Abstain. Barbara? Yes. Yes. Neil? I vote in favor. I vote aye. 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 That is 401. 401. <clears throat> to accept the application as complete. Okay. Board members, I don't know how deep you want to get into this, uh, considering that staff recommends we push the public hearing. If anybody has any questions, now would be the time. Do, do we need to do a, a motion on the waiver for the... Uh, I would not recommend making any decisions on waivers until we have all waivers actually requested and the final uh, plan set in place. So then I would make a motion that we continue this to... We still have a public hearing to have no happen. Mind. <laughs> no questions it. before public hearing? Well, I, I just had a question about the lighting waiver. Sure. I, what, was, what was the details on that? The, was the, the reason for the lighting waiver, the, the new regulations require that you have 0.2 foot candles or less at property lines and because they're utilizing an access and parking easement through that the property line actually runs right through the middle of the parking lot so it wouldn't make sense to not illuminate that parking lot where the property line runs through it so the staff supportive of a waiver because technically it's the property line exceeds the values of the intensity of the lighting on the property line where a property line typically isn't located. Mm. So in this okay. case, because it's an easement situation, the property line just runs right through the middle of the parking lot. It's unavoidable to not light that area. Okay, thank you. What's that? that question being answered, I'd like to open up the public hearing. If there are any members of the public that like to step forward with any questions? Seeing none, I'm going to go ahead and close the public hearing. Board members, do you have any other questions for the applicant? Barbara, go ahead. Hi. There are mature trees on that lot, okay. exceeding probably 15 inches in diameter. So what is the plan in the landscaping to replace those trees with mature trees, not young trees? So the trees that are being re uh, proposed meet the uh, per the town specifications, which are two and a half to three inch caliber. So that's a fairly good sized tree. Okay. Another question, Mr. Chairman? Yes, Barbara, go ahead. Um, how many bays are there to this particular building? Is it, in other words, how many businesses do you anticipate actually residing in that building? Oh, that oh, as far as it being partitioned internally, this is one big warehouse. Okay. So one user. So it's going to be one unit. Yeah. 
Okay. If I can, just in my experience with these types of facilities, they're designed so that they are subdividable, mm -hmm. so that you can separate and have individual business units. A building of 120,000 square feet in size, I could see anywhere from one to eight or nine, depending on how flatly it intends to lease the space to potential right. tenants. But these types of facilities, at least in my experience in other communities, has been that they start out as one big, right. but they do have the ability to be subdivided internally. Hence my question. Right. So the flex because buildings were already pre-portioned up, this one isn't. Okay. I guess I think their hope is to have one big user, but. Right, because with the traffic study, again, it's a short traffic study. Um, they anticipate 152 car trips, and I'm just wondering if you put four or five businesses in there, you probably going to have more than 152. So, anyways, just the, the reason for my question. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Do we have any other board members that wish to speak? We hear a motion to continue. So moved. So moved to by August 17th. Thank you. 7 p.m. only public notice. Second. Second. Correct. Moved by Lynn, seconded by Barbara. Roll call vote. Jamie, how do you vote on the continuance? Um, aye. Aye. Barbara? Aye. Aye. Neil? I vote in favor. Neil votes in favor. I vote aye. Aye. And Lynn votes aye. That's 6 0, zero to continue to Five. the 17th. Five. <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> it's been a long day at work. So we'll move it to the August 17th meeting. Great. Thank you. Next on the agenda, item number six, John Flatley Company. This is a review for acceptance and consideration of a site plan to construct an internal access road per the requirements of the Flatley Mixed Use to Conditional Use Permit. The parcels are located at 645, 673, 685, and 703 Daniel Webster Highway in the I-1 Industrial District and Aquifer Conservation Area. Tax map 6E, lots 003-01, 003-03, dash 03 dash 05 case planning board number 2021 dash 29 mr. chairman members of the board uh, the proposal uh, in this application is for the construction of about 3,800 feet of new access road internal to the uh, flatly uh, parcels uh, that would loop from the existing St. Cobain driveway around the site and back to Daniel Webster Highway across from the shared property line of the Depot Farm Sand and Crocker Hot Tub. Uh, in addition to the proposed access road, the applicant's proposing grading and stormwater management improvements uh, to benefit the future development of those parcels. Uh, their narrative indicates that the stormwater improvements do not contain an infiltration component, again, due to the requirements that NHDES has provided for these properties due to the PFAS situation. Uh, we note that the access road will service both areas that are part of the mixed-use project and areas that are not part of the CUP. Uh, the parts of the project that uh, will be outside of the CUP will follow the general industrial standards, whereas those obviously part of the CUP would be governed by the conditional use permit uh, that the board had previously granted. Uh, this Ask Us Road is not identical to, but it is consistent with the design intent of the conditional use permit. So staff recommends that, that it find that it's consistent with and uh, can move forward uh, through the planning board review process. Uh, at this point, we do not have the uh, peer review comments back on this application. Uh, there are a couple of waivers that we think are copy and paste errors from previous projects that uh, are listed on the plans. Uh, and ultimately, we don't think the board should uh, act on those waivers until we uh, get to a final hearing. Uh, our recommendation is to uh, accept the application as complete tonight as it meets the minimum requirements of the regulations and then continue the hearing to August 17th. Thank you, Tim. Mm -hmm. I move we accept the uh, application as relatively complete. Motion made by Lynn. Do I hear a second? Yes, I'll second that. Seconded by Neil. Roll call vote. Jamie, how do you vote on the completeness? I'm abstaining. Jamie abstains. Barbara? Aye. I'm sorry, Barbara, what was that? Aye. That was I. Neil? Aye. Aye for Neil. Aye. Aye for Lynn, and I vote aye as well. 
That is 401 in favor of completeness. Did you uh, want to do a presentation, Nate, or were you just comfortable as no. doing a continuance immediately? Okay. Move straight to the, compl to the uh, continuance. I'll, I'll move we continue this to the August 17th meeting, same time, same place, with no further public notice. Notice. Written notice. Written yep. notice. We have a motion by Lynn. Do I have a second? A second. Second by Neil. <clears throat> Jamie, how do you vote? Aye. Jamie votes aye. Barbara? Aye. Aye for Barbara. Neil? Aye. Aye for Neil. Lynn? Aye. Aye, and I vote aye as well. <coughs> That's 500 to continue the hearing. Thank you very much. Seeing as though our chairman is not currently present. <laughs> we get to continue. I guess we'll just continue without him. Next on the agenda is item seven, discussion possible action regarding other items of concern. Nothing. <clears throat> Anybody have anything to bring up? Neil, I, just, I just had a question about um, the, um, the vaults yep. storage. Mm -hmm. I noticed that they have a bunch of stuff sitting in the front lot, and I don't know if I missed a meeting or something, but I thought he wasn't going to be constructing the new part of the building because he didn't want to put the sidewalk in. He has to do the sidewalk. So okay. That's part of the approval, so the sidewalk right, just, will have to be done. Yeah. I just, so yep. that was, I know it was approved, but they, he had to come back, I believe, asking for an amendment to remove the requirement. Or I think during the hearing, he tried to get the board not to require it, but ultimately the board required the full yeah. sidewalk, and that will be required before any occupancy is allowed in that. Yeah. And if you've seen the condition of the gravel oh, yeah. walkway, it's certainly almost non existent already. Yeah. So that's why I'm glad the board decided to require an actual real sidewalk this Yeah, and, and that'll continue all the way along the frontage of the whole property. That is the understanding I have is that yes. it has to be a formal pro sidewalk and that striped area across the front will not suffice for part first for sidewalk under this application. Okay. Very good. Thank you. All set. Yeah. Any yeah, other points of uh, any other points of discussion? I just had Tim? a brief thing I was going to mention. I have not watched the meeting from two weeks ago, but I do understand there was a fairly good discussion at the end about traffic studies and tra and uh, fiscal impact studies that uh, will certainly put on a uh, future uh, agenda. Uh, but I do want to put on my economic development hat for a moment and state that uh, while I understand that there's some trepidation about short analysis versus full analysis for traffic studies, the expense and time and review costs involved with full analyses where they're not warranted is enough to drive an applicant away from town. It's, the cost is that high when you have to do the physical counts, do the actual full analysis of a traffic study. It is a significant concern I have for trips, for, for sites that have less than 100 peak hour trips, which is our standard in our regulations. To do anything more than a short analysis, we risk losing them to another community or them backing out entirely. There is a significant cost factor involved with the a full traffic analysis, and I just want to make the board aware of that. The other thing I want to remind the board, because I, and I, it's unfortunate Nelson isn't here, because I think some of this came from Nelson, uh, is the fact that we need to remember that uh, less than two years ago, we didn't require traffic studies at all. There was no requirement in any of our regulatory requirements to do traffic analysis of any plan, and there was no teeth to the board requiring them until 2019 when we did the new regulations. Uh, the traffic impact analysis section of these regulations is something that not only did I work on here, I spent a number of years honing and refining during my time in Londonderry uh, as the town planner there in terms of making sure that they're applicable, accurate, and fair to both the community to get the results and information that we need as well as to applicants that are going through the review process. So that's just wanted to set the groundwork for when we have a deeper discussion that I have to balance the planning and the economic development parts of my job. And even as a planner, I, I have a hard time for you know, a project that only generates you know, 20 or 30 trips in the peak to require them to do a full traffic analysis. It's, it's, it's really a tremendous burden on a project. So I just wanted to get that out in advance. But uh, yes, Barbara. And I agree with you completely, but I think the question comes up when you have certain projects, such as the Flatley mm -hmm. project, 
where you've got five existing apartment buildings, yep. one more being planned with 92 units. You've got three warehouses on the main campus, and then you've got the one on the north building as well. And I think when that is a special circumstance, and the code does allow for that, that we look at it in the entirety of the project to say, what is the actual ramifications, and are there any safety issues? Because ultimately, not only are you all responsible for the safety of the town in the traffic yep. situation, as I am as a town councilor, ultimately. Absolutely. And because that's why So that's why I think, yep. you know, if it's just, you know, a house or, a, uh, you know, a small development a on a side street, sure. I don't think, but anything that's on DW, that's a huge project, and this is a huge project. Yep then I think those are special circumstances. And yes, we need a full traffic study to evaluate mm -hmm. all of those different components in one and what the ultimate outcome yeah. is. And in Flatley's case, they did that. When they went through the conditional use permit okay. process, they had to do a full traffic analysis. And when was that, Tim? That was done in 2014. 2014 mm -hmm. was a long and, time ago. And that's why, because DOT has jurisdiction out there, they're requiring additional updates to that mm -hmm. information as they go forward. However, again, I. I don't want to belabor the point because it's already happened at this stage, but mm -hmm. it's it's a concern of mine. I have uh, Mr. Turner, who is here for the project uh, for Thomas More. He has a significantly large 300,000 plus square foot project coming in that you'll be seeing in a month or so, and it's in the southern section of Daniel Webster Highway, and it's probably going to be short analysis not only because it's less than 100 peak hour trips that are generated from that facility, but the capacity out in the southern part of DW when you get south of Industrial Drive and Greeley Street where you have four lanes of traffic, there really aren't the traffic concerns based on the volumes that we have currently out there that we have in the northern section of DW. Before we go any further, let me formally hand the meeting back over to uh, <laughs> Chairman Best. Sorry, I was a little late coming back. Um, so I assume we're on the discussion, other items yeah. of concern. Correct. Um, Tim, it may help for folks to um, uh, get a uh, get their arms around traffic and traffic analysis to um, maybe go through some of the properties around town that we've looked at recently and get a sense of what the peak trip hours are for a site. For example, I, I, I can recall the outlet mall is something like 1,200 or, or even higher than that per peak hour, and obviously it's it's um, a lighted intersection with um, four, two lanes in each direction and all of that, but some of the other ones that we might see where it's, you know, 65 or 88, I think the, the exit 11 apartment building is something in the 80s in peak hour traffic. In, in anticipation that this was gonna be coming, I've actually started pulling the traffic count data from the last couple of years from DOT and uh, National Regional Planning Commission, just so I have some raw daily numbers to give us some background as to what we're talking about. I don't have that information compiled at this point, but that'll be something I'll have prepared when we discuss this yeah. in more detail. Yeah, it would help just so that when we hear uh, the number of peak hours and you see 100 or less than 100 as a different kind of analysis, that we can all have sort of a mental picture of saying, oh, that's like 7-Eleven. Or that's 7-Eleven is way bigger than that. It's much less than that. Or you know, uh, or you know, I don't want to pick on any particular. But, you know, the, you, you name a business, but we could have kind of a a sense of what that looks like. Um, I can also offer up for folks that um, on a couple of the projects, including the Exit 11 one, um, we had the uh, applicants sort of go and verify their traffic engineers' numbers with real sites that had the apartments and sort of see how does this actually prove out? Are you right when you tell me there's gonna be 88 or whatever the number is? And every time that we've asked them to do that, it's been um, either uh, very, very precise or conservative where there was less trips than what they had said that there was gonna be in these sites. Um, the traffic analysis scientist folks um, are really good at this. They really have gotten precise. They're, they're almost as good as the ones that predict the number of school kids, um, which, is really <laughs> remarkably accurate uh, when you when you see that um, the number of, of automobiles for the, the size of apartments based on the bedrooms is just I mean it's down to a science where they know it's 0.8 cars per two bedroom unit and it's not 0.7 sometimes it's always 0.8 um, <laughs> they they know what they're doing yeah so um, and, and we've had our own peer reviewers take a look at these things obviously we're not taking anybody on blind faith but um, 
the traffic the traffic studies that we've gotten and the information that we've gotten and when we say that we're comfortable with lower traffic counts um, it's based on a lot of good good data and knowledge and so far I can't say that we'll always be right I can't say that we always have been right um, but I'm not aware of a site that we had sort of just blown it on the traffic study um, even some of the ones where there's some traffic in the area when you think of East Chamberlain Road or Neighbor Works or something like that, and you know DW Highway's busy, you'll never see the traffic coming from those two developments. The traffic is there. It was already there. It's not coming from Merrimack 360. It's not coming from any of the things that we've considered and approved. Yeah, the, the, the one of the parts of the, the science and art of traffic studies is being able to differentiate and calculate the number of pass-by trips that are already on that corridor versus the en trip ends and destinations, which is the intended end point and start point mm -hmm. of a trip. Uh, Merrimack 360 is probably between 40 and 60 percent pass by traffic. It's traffic that's already on the roads that just decides when they go by, I'm stopping there. Right. It wasn't their intended destination when they left their start point. Uh, so that's, that's part of the analyses that traffic engineers and uh, analysts go through is uh, doing that. And it's that type of information that's why when you have 240 apartment units you don't get 480 cars coming out at the same time because there's that yep. science and, involved and that 40 to using Merrimack 360 as an example if 40 to 60 percent of their traffic is people who are already going to go down Daniel Webster Highway anyway um, that portion of their traffic didn't add anything to the amount of flow that there is on DW Highway that was already going to be there no matter what. Um, and and the, de the, the developer didn't cause any more traffic, at least for that portion of what's going on. No, Pass-by um, trips is an attraction for a developer because it's the, that's their audience. They want to capture those people as the pass-by trips. Yeah, if they weren't getting pass-by trips, there's no point in being on DW Highway. Yeah. So, <laughs> we'll, be, we'll be somewhere else where if we don't, I'm not going to get any pass-by trips. Um, Anyway, there's a lot to the understanding of it. I'm sorry, Barbara, I wasn't turning my head no, away. You know, because one of the things I was thinking about since, you know, uh, with our favorite project, Flatley, is maybe, and I think this happened also with the exit of 11 new apartment buildings. Maybe we can talk to the town to do a study at Bedford Road Lights and see how that coordinates with the ones going into, because, uh, the Bedford Road DW uh, intersection, the lights there, they may need a little bit of tweaking to maybe move that traffic north and south a little bit better. That was the key intersection for that study for Flatley? I mean, I'm recused on, my, on that one, so right. I don't have any opinion. I don't think it's really, anything, on anything I've read, I don't see that that's ever been considered. Not, not a the, specifically studied intersection except for the full study that was done when the original project came yeah. in. Yeah, and as we know, things have you know changed a yes. little bit. Yeah, there were tolls at that exit, at exit 12. <laughs> there you point, go. You know? And so, you know, that might be a solution as we move forward with this project to maybe ask the town to do the same kind of counting that they did at exit 11, just to see if anything needs to be tweaked. I don't know the town specifically did anything with exit 11 that I was aware of. Uh, yeah, Kyle Fox was out okay. there. They, yeah. they may have gotten some stuff yeah. done with NRPC that I wasn't made aware of. Because that but. intersection up to that point is within the town's yes. urban yep. compact so at least that's within yeah. the town's control i know that the traffic study for the executive park project is probably the most complex and comprehensive traffic impact analysis that i've had to review and be involved with in my 20 plus years as a planner that project was necessitated by the existing condition being what it was, mm -hmm. knowing that there was a broken loop detector in Continental Boulevard and that the lights weren't coordinated. So that was a significant collaborative effort between the town, the developer, not only District 5 of DOT, but also the Bureau of Turnpikes. It was a very large undertaking that it still is the most massive traffic study I've seen in my life. Yeah, and it took, it took some political will to push the DOT to do that. Um, but there is a similarity with exit 11 to exit 12 at Bedford Road in that that light at Bedford Road in front of the um, Walgreens is causing the traffic. Yeah. Um, it's the thing that, that makes it back all the way up to the Bolin Alley. Um, it's not that there's people coming and going. There's a hot, or there's a, or a significant number of more people, you know, north of that intersection than south of that intersection. The timing of that light is I ineffective 
at managing the traffic. I don't know if ours. it was. What's that? And that one's ours. That's ours. That's ours. Yeah. Um, and the, and I don't know if the timing of that light was originally determined when they were thinking about traffic off of the highway or whatever it was, but um, the, the uh, southbound green signal is too short. Um, mm -hmm. And that's why it does what it does. Um, now, when you get into that traffic and you start with uh, up by the jacuzzi place waiting in line, it's only two light cycles. It's four and a half minutes or something like that because I've sat in it plenty of times. It's not like it takes you an hour to get through it. It's, you know, it is. And it, it could be better. It's, it's especially annoying because it's a man-made problem. It, it's, not, it's not a natural traffic situation. But anyway. Um, another discussion for another time. Yeah, I, I, but it's good for all of us as planning board members to gain experience on understanding traffic studies as well as it would be for lighting plans and landscape plans and native trees and what the uh, Conservation Commission always wants, which is, you know, the, the nitrogen and slow, slow release nitrogen free fertilizers. And that's part of the regs now. They don't need to make that comment anymore. No, they, they, and they haven't been. <laughs> um, but uh, and straw versus um, hay and um, green snow pro. So, but it's all becomes it all comes from having you know experience on this board with being here here in these decisions. Does anyone else have any other discussion items? Well, so, you know, it's such a short meeting. Yeah, um, I do actually have a question or so. Um, the 360 complex, the Haywards. There is a a. a horrible car stacking problem over there um i've been over there on several occasions where there's 15 20 cars and they they come around and they line all the way up in front of the complex and so it impedes traffic flow with almost three three of the parking it, it like weighs out and um i know that we looked at the car stacking when we approved uh, the gas station up on uh, exit 11 and that was one of the things that we discussed was car stacking we didn't want it going out into the parking lot do you remember if we ever talked about that with that project I mean it we it, it did seems not, like it should yeah. have it but was in the it was approved under the old regulations so we did not have the stacking requirements that we have in the current regs so hmm. the current regs address these types of situations. and so now it's it's now it's, it is what it is it is what it is we can't go back and force them they would have to come in to ask for something else on the property in order for that to be opened back up for discussion. Wow. I think also one of the unique things <laughs> there is they're really stacking, like you said, 15 or 20 cars. Literally. And, right. and most of the planning approaches you would take would consider, you know, six or eight would be the number you would think that they would get, but because it takes longer to serve ice cream and it's, you know, the thing everybody's trying to do with COVID is drive through the ice cream store yeah. instead of going in it, mm -hmm. yeah. um, that they're getting that, that stacking problem. but. Even if we had run them through the analysis, we would have said, okay, plan for seven or plan for 10, and they're getting 15 they're or 20. They're getting more than that, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. To see it wrap around the building, I guess, would have been a, a good idea, but it's just right out into the, the main yeah. drive, and uh, oh, I can it's tell impeding you, the traffic flow. Like, and, and I think next year we won't see that problem. Yeah, I think no. the more people will be comfortable walking up to the window right. from COVID because it really wasn't there last summer either. Right. Yeah. Uh, or the summer before, yeah, last they, summer was yeah. COVID. The current regulations call for 10 stacking spaces for restaurant drive throughs Yeah. I mean, it doesn't get you your ice cream any faster. Right. right. <laughs> no, and actually, the few times where I've been there with the family and Lexi's like, let's go through the drive through I'm like, you bumped your head. <laughs> 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 hey, there's no ice cream they have. <laughs> <laughs> we can walk up to the window because there's nothing that makes me yeah. wait in that line. Right, right. Okay, I was just curious about why. It's the that function might be. of when it was approved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank and again, you. even if it was approved under the current regulations, 10 would have been what was required, and they're still exceeding that. So. Yeah, yeah. What else did you have on your mind? No, that was all. I thought you had a couple. Well, I already, the other one I already there just somewhere. asked one about uh, the, the vault. The vault. Get, they have uh, material on site to build there, the building. Yeah, yeah so I, I had a material. question to make sure that they're still putting their sidewalk in. <laughs> Another, it's another, another, building. another storage building. Yeah. Another storage building. That, that storage is, is super high demand, not, not just for them, but everywhere you go. I'm just going to put out a plea to anybody who is watching. And if you're watching and you want to talk to your neighbors and your friends, right now there's a huge demand for members on not only the planning board, but the zoning board. Um, both of these boards have five regular members, and that's it. 
Um, the planning board has one alternate. The zoning board has no alternates. So if you want to bring something before or you know somebody who wants to bring something before one of these boards and somebody is sick or somebody is out of town, there may be an issue. So I want you to consider putting your name in. Um, it doesn't take a lot of time. It can be interesting. It can be boring. But it doesn't take a lot of time. doesn't take a lot of effort. The staff is hugely helpful in educating any of us in what we're doing and what we need to do. And please, please, please consider joining one of these two boards. I'll echo that. And the local government won't work if people aren't willing to roll up their sleeves and come be a part of it. That's the way New Hampshire's government, small town, works. Um, it takes people that are willing to do it. If you don't do it, then sooner or later the state will pass a law that says, you know, all the approvals are done in Concord. Mm. And we don't want that. Mm. No, you don't, definitely don't want that. But please, put your name in. Just as an example, I not only serve as staff to the boards here, but I actually am part of the Architectural Design Review Committee in my hometown. That's I was just appointed by the planning board to that. So even I, who gets enough of this here, I still am a glutton enough to know that uh, volunteerism in your community is very important and uh, certainly encourage it. And we are more than willing to help train, provide education, training resources for anybody who is just re who's interested in any of the land use board positions. Uh, as was mentioned, we have seven members currently on the planning board, so all of our full member positions are currently filled. Uh, we have one alternate, uh, but as you've seen in recent months, uh, when people are on vacation and aren't here, uh, and somebody has to recuse, we end up in situations where we're skimming it for a quorum and. Uh, we're in danger of uh, having significant uh, ramifications in terms of development review uh, in the community if we don't uh, fill some of these positions and have some alternates available for uh, those situations where the regular members can't be here. So please, 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 please consider volunteering. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, absolutely. Show your kids what the what, you're, what they're supposed to do to be good citizens in town. Demonstrate for them. Show it. Show what it's like. If not here, you know, coach a soccer team or whatever. It doesn't have to be government, but volunteer. Demonstrate. Um, be a part of what's going on and meet meet some people if you're if you're new in town you're bored you don't know anybody yeah it's a good way to meet a bunch of people anyway enough of that soapbox other discussion items then we're up to the minutes uh, the approval of the minutes of july 6 2021 what say you put forth a motion to approve the minutes in their current form is there a second for paul's motion second second by councillor healy any discussion uh jamie how do you vote? Aye. Barbara? Aye. Neil? I'm saying. Paul? Aye. Lynn? And I vote yes. So that is 402 with two abstentions. Uh, there is no other business before the planning board this evening, and so it would be appropriate to have a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second it. Count, count those as motions and seconds. <laughs> Uh, we'll count Lynn as the motion and Barbara as the second, and Paul will be the third. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, let's see. we got to do a roll call vote for that, too. Jamie, how do you vote? I'm sorry, what was that for? Adjourn. Adjourn. Oh, adjourn? Yes. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Barbara? Yes. Neil? Aye. Paul? I vote aye. Lynn? Aye. I vote aye as well. Hey, Jamie, thank you for dialing in and, um, d and interrupting your trip with a little bit of our business. We thank you. And now that we know how to do it, we can do this in other meetings yeah. as well. No problem. My pleasure. All right. We are adjourned. Um, thank you, everyone, for the work. And don't forget to turn your microphones off.